Oh, okay. All right, so let's go ahead and take our uh, Bibles to Colossians. This is a new Bible study uh, for those of you that are watching by way of the video. And glad to have you with us today. Um, it's exciting times and brand new year. And we are in a new book as well. And uh, looking forward to sharing with you the book of uh, Colossians. So let's take we're, the first type. The first uh, thing we're going to do is look at this study sheet here. This is an introduction uh, to the book. Now I'm doing something different. Years ago, I think it was 2016, I preached through the book of Colossians. These are those notes. So what I'm doing is something a little bit different. I'm going to go through the book kind of like a preaching method, and I'm just adapting it to a Bible study. So there's going to be a little bit of application, that kind of stuff that we'll throw in there as well, like you're sitting in a sermon. And uh, But we want it to be able to uh, input as well, though, okay? So if you got your coffee and you're ready to go, uh, let's do it, all right? So let's just take a look, first of all, at the study sheet, because this is where most of the stuff is today. Uh, look at the little map you'll see there is talking about where the city of Colossae is located. Now, this is the area of Asia Minor and Paul's journeys. Remember, he went on his first journey, then the second journey, uh, third journey and a trip to Rome. This would be considered part of his second journey that he would go to Colossae and then Philippi and other places as well. So all of this is there. And uh, But now take a look at your... your uh, Number one, capital A, Colossians is considered a prison epistle. Now, why do you think it's called a prison epistle? Because where was he at when he wrote it? He was in prison. And uh, so he was in prison on several occasions, but he was in prison when he wrote this book. And also we have Ephesians, Philippians, <clears throat> and Philemon all together. So this is going to be a study about Colossians, but really we're going to group several of the epistles together. So Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, that's an order in your New Testament, right? When you say your books of the Bible, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And so, and then you have Philemon as well. So all four of those are prison epistles. Uh, AD 62 was when we think this was written. Now let's put that in context. <clears throat> when did Jesus die? 33 AD. Yes, yeah, so, well, we know that he was 33 when he died. Was it 33 A.D.? Was it 30 A.D.? Some people believe that Jesus was born maybe about 3 B.C. That doesn't make sense because B.C. stands for before Christ. So how can he die? How can he be born, you know, in 3 B.C.? Because he, but the calendar's messed up. But some people think he was born right around 3 B.C., which 38 or even eight. Yeah. So we know he lived 33 and a half years. So maybe around 30 to 33, somewhere in that time frame, right? This is 62. 62 AD. So what happened uh, between Jesus dying and Paul writing the book of Colossians? Well, about 30 years happened. Can a lot happen in 30 years? Where were you 30 years ago? <laughs> right? Now you're still doing electrician work, right? Doing all your stuff. Or maybe in a tree uh, or shooting a deer somewhere, right? You were dealing cards at Atlantic City 30 years ago, right? So 30 years, a lot can happen. So Jesus has died. He's risen again. Pentecost has come. Peter and the apostles, the early church started. Paul has gotten saved. Paul is now being commissioned. He's already gone on one missionary journey. Now this is his second journey. Now we have the, the Colossi. He goes to the city of Colossae. So interesting, isn't it? All the stuff that's going on here. Did he go to the city even? We're going to talk about that. So all this is happening after Christ and so a lot has taken place. So keep on going now. Capital B, uh, four messengers who left Rome. We know that Tychicus, uh, we find that Paul wrote to Tychicus, the letter of Ephesians. He was the pastor there. Epaphroditus got the letter of the Philippians. He was the pastor there. Epaphras got the letter to the Colossians. He was the pastor there. So there are these leaders of these uh, city churches now remember again, it's not like today uh, when we talk about, okay, uh, First Baptist Church of Pensacola, okay? Well, there's a lot of Baptist churches in Pensacola, right? So you, you just no longer, you just don't say the church in Pensacola, okay? Which one of the 500 churches is in Pensacola? But back then, the church at Colossae, there's just one, and that's the one Paul started. The church at Philippi, that's why it terms it that way. So 
there's not much going on except for what God has laid the foundation. So he's our, these are the churches. These are the leaders of those churches. Onesimus uh, was the man the, the book of Philemon is written to. So the Philemon, of course, you know the story about Onesimus. Philemon was his master, and he was trying to get him to return to him. That was what all this, all these were at that time. So keep reading. These four are commonly called the anatomy of Christianity or the anatomy of the church. These four books, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, cover all aspects of the Christian faith. Ephesians is about the body of the believers called the church, of which Christ is the head. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Colossians, directs our attention to the head of the body who is Christ. The body is secondary. Christ is the theme in the book of Colossians. Colossians emphasizes the pleroma, or that Christ is the fullness of God. And that's what we're going to look at, all about Jesus in Colossians. Then Philippians shows the church walking on the earth. Christian living is the theme. It is the periphery of the circle of which Christ is the center. Philippians emphasizes the kenosis, where Christ became a man and a servant and then died. Philemon gives us Christianity in action where the rubber meets the road. Now that he's a, a slave, now he's a brother and a lord, uh, Paul says, how about letting him go free? All right, capital C, the place, the church at Colossae met in the home of Philemon. Probably never was a church building there. Interesting. Because we always think of a church as a building, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you go to church? Notice that phrase. Where do you go to church? We're thinking building. But we are the church. We are the church, right? Cross and Crown Baptist Church is the church located in this building. It just happens to be a building here. But if the building gets, the doors are locked because of the government saying you can't meet, well, that's fine. We'll meet somewhere else. Yeah. You know, we are a church. We don't need a building. Right. Uh, the city, <clears throat> the great civilization of Colossae, it had a great population. It was a door to the Orient to the east called the Gates of Phrygia. Here is where the east and west would meet. The Roman Empire attempted to tame the east and bring it under Roman subjugation. The fortress city, like Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, Thyatira, and Pergamon, all of these were great defense cities to defend from enemies from the east. Now remember who's at the east. Now look at that little map again up in the corner. As you're looking at Colossae and Ephesus and Philippi, okay, Rome is way off in the distance up there in the top left. So if you go to the other way, to the east, what do we have over there? Well, you've got Russia, China, Mongolia, Iran, Iraq, all of those guys are over there. And there was a lot of aggression, we'll find out later on, from Islam coming from that way. And Rome was constantly trying to fight them off. And so they made these great fortress cities. Colossae, Thyatira, like we mentioned, these were great, had a lot of garrison of Roman soldiers there to stop any enemies marching across trying to come to the area of Rome because it's not very far away. Okay, it's Max knocking on the door. He's okay. Uh -huh. I thought someone was knocking. Come on in. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so no, no, look at the note. By the time of Paul, Rome was in charge and the city lapsed into paganism and gross immorality. So now Colossae, by the way, let's stop a minute. Who ruled the world before Rome? Put your thinking cap on. Who ruled the world before Rome? Egypt. Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Alexander the Great. The Greeks. Now, the Egyptians had become really more of a sub-power because they were powerful, but Alexander had conquered everything. Remember this? He conquered this whole area. Matter of fact, Philippi is named after is it Alexander's dad, Philip. So he named things. I think another one was named after his daughter, his wife, a lot of these cities. So these are all um, Greek. What, what language are they all speaking? They're all speaking Greek, not Egyptian. Yeah, okay? right. So all of this is Greek. All this is Greek that's there. And Paul, at the time, <clears throat> they were all still speaking Greek, but now the Romans had come in, and they were the leaders now. Okay? So you're dealing with paganism, the Greek pagans, but then Rome, 
all of the paganism of Rome? And where are the Jews? Well, where do Jews meet? What are the buildings called? Synagogues. Synagogues. So according to the Jewish tradition, wherever there was enough families that got together that were Jewish, they could have a synagogue. And there were synagogues all over the Roman provinces, okay? So Paul knew that, and he was going to go to those places first. When he got to a city, okay, what am I going to do now? First place he went? To a synagogue. Presented Christ, the fulfillment of all of your prophecies. And then from there, he'd start going out skirts of the city to the marketplaces where you buy food start telling people about jesus <clears throat> start preaching against the paganism and so forth do you think that got him in trouble you don't oh think. man all the time <laughs> it's like going to a muslim city right and you're saying hey I, I, can i call you over here come on over here guys let me tell you about jesus christ and how you need to repent and trust him as your savior what are they going to do to you <laughs> Depend, depends on which faction of Islam yeah. you're dealing with there, right? The Shiite or the whatever, you know, you, you may end up getting your head cut off right then. Certainly you're going to be in trouble, if not kick, either kicked out or put in jail, because you just can't do that. that. Paul had that same problem. He would go in there and he knew at one point he was taken out of the city and stoned to death. Okay. We forget that, mm -hmm. how hostile this could be. Mm -hmm. unless God was going before you. And that's why sometimes Paul was afraid. And God said, do not be afraid. I have much people in this city. I mean, he needed to hear that. Because you can imagine if you're going, <clears throat> what do you, Lord, really? You want me to go where? You want me, yeah. to, go, you want me yeah. to go You want me to go to Iran? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. By the way, I have, I have gotten letters from young couples who are going to places just like that. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, Okay, are you ready? And they're ready. About brave. They're ready. Mm -hmm. And so here's Paul now. He's going to go into this city. He's lapsed into paganism and immorality. So look at the point. Paul never visited the city. Even though Paul was never in the city, he founded the church. Now, how do you do that? He touched many people in the Roman Empire who eventually gravitated to the area there. So here's a thought. As Paul was traveling through, he was leading people to Christ. Well, those people, as he was meeting them on the way, on the journey, in the marketplaces or wherever, they gravitated to the city of Colossae, and he realized, oh, you're all meeting there. So he wrote the letter to them. Him, we believe, he himself probably had never actually been to Colossae, even though they were there. Epaphras was their pastor. It may be that some of Paul's converts in Ephesus migrated to form the nucleus of the church. Uh, by the way, that happens all the time. Uh, we helped start a church. Here we are in Pensacola, Florida. We helped start a church in New Mexico, Las Cruces. Okay, We helped start Mountain View Baptist Church. The pastor of that church who went out there and started that church, he was our youth leader here. He was actually working as a junior church <coughs> leader. And then he moved there, started that church. We went out there, knocked on doors, helped him put a sign up, everything else. And that church is now still functioning. It's called Mountain View Baptist Church. Same thing, we, we sent uh, Dan Tesson out of Cross of Crown Baptist Church. He went to the Philippines. Did you know there's a Cross of Crown Baptist Church in the Philippines? Hmm. Sure, there is, yeah. We had another guy who left our church, went to Michigan. He started a Cross of Crown Baptist Church in Michigan. My associate pastor left this church. He's at Tennessee right now at Clarksville. It is called Cross and Crown Baptist Church in Clarksville, Tennessee. Hmm. See how it works? Yeah. So even though... Uh, I was never in Michigan. I haven't been to, I mean, I've been to Michigan, but not that church. And I've never been to Philippines. But those churches are there. Where'd they come from? From someone who came out of this church. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. So Ephesus, and they went and formed another church over in Colossae. Colossae. Okay, so Ephesus was 75 to 100 miles west. Paul was in Ephesus for three years. Uh, two spent in the school of Tyrannus, John, Mark, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, all there at one time with Paul as well. These are some big names in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, now, at the time, they just felt like they were uh, the offscoring of the world, being kicked around and persecuted by everybody. But now we look at them and say, wow, the Catholic Church turns around and makes all saints out of them, names churches after them, right? <laughs> and, uh, of course, we don't agree with that, but these are all great guys. And then paganism, heathenism, and mysterious religions abounded as well as culture. So capital E, the challenge to the believers in Colossae. Okay, I'm a Christian. I live in Colossae. What are you going to face? Well, let's talk about that. First of all, there was a heresy that was starting to creep in. And by the way, that's what happens. 
You get saved, you start meeting a few people. Hey, let's worship the Lord together. And then you're, you're having services, you know, meeting and praying. And then someone shows up. Hey, can I join with you guys? I, I love Jesus. I heard about Jesus. Oh yeah, come on in. Because you're so welcoming, right? Come on in, come on in. Next thing you know, you're all talking around, having fellowship. And they start saying certain things that they didn't have a Bible yet, right? They didn't have all the doctrines that we have. So Paul hadn't written them yet, okay? So this is what's happening. These, these weird philosophies are starting to come in and you're thinking that, okay, is that, is that right? So Paul is having to deal with these aberrant things, these <laughs> false doctrines. And so this is what Colossians is about. It's correcting a lot of this problem. Okay, so Gnosticism uh, is what we're dealing with hugely here. The Essenes were at Colossae. These are all... Gnostics. So let me tell you what the Gnostics are. Three points of identification of the Gnostics at the bottom. Number one, the Gnostics believed uh, in, the, in the exclusivity of their doctrine. They were the only ones that were right. They were the aristocrats in wisdom, monopoly of everything. If you truly want to know about Jesus, you need to come talk to me. Right? It does sound like a priest or a pope in that sense too, doesn't it? Well, we have the last word. Just come, come over here. This is not the Catholic Church, though. By the way, the Catholic Church hadn't even been formed yet. But this is, kind of shows you how it can happen. The super-duper in knowledge, they believed they were even more knowledgeable than the apostles. Okay, let's flip it over to the next page. <clears throat> Speculative tenets on creation. This is some of their weird things that they taught. God did not create the universe directly. Now, we believe that God simply said, let there be, right? And there it was. It was so cute last night. Uh, I'm doing some kitchen renovations, and Joshua and the, uh, Whitley, my little granddaughter, came over, and, and Tiffany. Joshua's working on his brakes, and uh, Whitley's, you know, she's doing this, Papa. And so I picked her up, and we went outside. It was a beautiful, clear night, and the moon mm -hmm. was only about half, but it was beautiful. And I had holding Whitley up in the dark, and I said, Look up there. She goes, You know, <laughs> and I said, That's the moon. Oh, and I said, God made the moon, oh, and God, God made the moon, huh? She can't say God yet. She barely says Paw Paw, but I start him early. I remember taking Josh, her daddy, doing the same thing, walking outside saying, Josh, God made the moon. Then I'd say, who made the moon? God. Oh. That's right. <laughs> And so now I got the granddaughter, his daughter doing yeah. it, and just instilling all of that in there. And that's, you know, teaching who made everything. God made everything. He spoke it into existence. So, so God did, according to the Gnostics, God did not create the universe like that. He created a creature who in turn created another creature until one finally created the physical universe. Christ was considered one of those creatures in a long series of creations. This was known in pantheistic Greek philosophy as demiurg. Okay. Now, by the way, if you thought about the Mormons, notice that the Mormons, they look at Jesus Christ as just one of the sons of God, that Elohim was one of the gods, and then Jesus was just a, a descendant of that. Uh, and then Mormons themselves believe they have become gods yeah. and they have their own planets. And yeah. you, you, Mormons, if, if you really understand what they believe, they're not just nice people who dress well and ride a bike really good. <laughs> That's not who they are. There's more to them than that. Yeah. They're, her they're heretics is what they are. And so we, we understand that this whole idea of this great knowledge that only the Gnostics know these things and they come up with these other doctrines, that's a problem. Okay, Paul refutes that. Take a look. You're in Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 15. Notice what he says in verse 15. Who is, talking about Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him, that's Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and, be, and by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus is not just one among many. No, no, no. He is the one who did it all. That's and right. so this is why that verse is there. Paul is dealing with this philosophy. Chapter 2, look at chapter 2, verse 18. Let no man beguile you 
of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So the worshiping of angels, Jesus is just one of the heavenly bodies that were uh, created to do certain things, and that's why we worship this Jesus. And Paul says, no, 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 we, we don't worship angels. Jesus is not just an angel, we worship God. And this is, when you look at the context of it, it makes a lot of sense why he wrote Colossians. Number three, um, characteristic of Gnosticism, ethical practice of asceticism and unrestrained licentiousness. Now, asceticism came from the influence of Greek Stoicism. And so you have two things going on here. You have the aesthetics, and then you have the, the uh, Epicureans. What do the Epicureans believe? We even have the Epicurean clubs here in America. What is that? And basically live for today. That's right. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Or what does the YOLO stand for? You only live once. You only live, you only once. live once. You hear this all the time. YOLO! Uh, you only <clears throat> live once. Go for it. Have Not fun. Me. Yeah. So <laughs> the idea is, hey, who cares? Just go, go do your thing. Mm -hmm. So you have one part that says, well, there's a, a separation issue. Then the other part that says, well, just go have fun and enjoy yourself. And they'll look at the two different aspects of your, your soul that you can, you can, in your soul, you can serve your God <laughs> that you believe in. But in your body, it's different than your soul. Go do what you want. Go do anything you want. See the difference? And that's what the idea, the, the, the teaching they thought there. Now, let me show you chapter 2. Look at verse 16. Uh, we already looked at that one. And then um, look at verse 23. Which things have indeed of show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body. See that? Neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So these, what he's telling you here is he's dealing with the teaching of the Gnostics of uh, the aesthetics neglect the body, but then you have the other side of them. Some teach that, hey, you can satisfy your flesh, both of those. And Paul's going to deal with that all in this book. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And then he talks about your flesh, fornication and uncleanness. See, all of this stuff, inordinate affection, concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Um, look at verse 7 in the which ye also walked sometime when you lived in them, but now put off these, anger, malice, and so forth. So Paul is dealing with, hey, listen, you can't, if you are a born-again believer, you don't just do what you want to do. If you truly are born again, then you serve the Lord, okay? Mm -hmm. We were talking about one of the young men in our church during the revival last week raised his hand for salvation. And... Um, you know, we were just dealing with the issue of, and he prayed. He prayed the prayer to be saved. We had two that did that, one young lady and then a young man. And the young man still says, well, I just don't know. I don't know. And we, the thought was, I tried to encourage him, was, listen, when you trust Christ as your Savior, he's, I think he's waiting for a feeling. I think he's saying, I didn't get that feeling that everyone talks about when you get saved. I told him, I said, listen, salvation is not a feeling. Now, you might feel good about it. I said, but the key is your dependent faith rests upon the word of God and you believed God for salvation. Now rest upon that. You will find as the Holy Spirit starts to remake you into a new creature, that's what the Bible says, all things are passed away, old things passed away, all things becoming new. You're going to find a whole new outlook on life. You're going to see a whole new attitude Amen. and everything else starts to change. Right? Amen. Well, these Colossians had none of that. And Paul's saying, listen, this is what happens in your life there. And notice what he says. Look at verse 5 again of <clears> chapter <throat> 3. Mortify therefore your members. Now stop. What is that? Look at the, the, the construct of that English phrase. Mortify therefore. Despise your body. Well, no. Even, let's go even, let's back up a little bit. Therefore. Who's he talking to? The Colossians. Mm -hmm. But then look at Who's the subject of mortify therefore? Is he saying he should mortify? When you see a phrase like mortify therefore, it is a, a phrase that means you mortify therefore. Now, if I am to mortify my members which are upon the earth, 
we always say, well, God's going to do all the changing in your heart. That's true. But he doesn't say, let God therefore mortify your members. He doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. He says, you mortify your members. Okay. You stop this. So it is a volitional thing. It mm -hmm. always is. It's even salvation. God doesn't save you beyond your will. You have to believe yourself. Then one, and there's, there's those that say, no, that we have this irresistible grace that comes along and I just have to trust Christ and we call this Calvinism. No, we have to choose by our own will to trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. But the, who does the saving? Me, because I did that? No, no, God did it, but I've got to choose to do it. All right, same thing here. If I'm going to mortify, therefore, my members upon the earth, well, God's got to do it. I just let God do it in my life. I'm just living and God's doing everything. Yeah, but he expects you to make the decision. You decide not to go into the bar. You decide not to go into the strip club. You decide not to click on that website. You decide that. See, that's what he's saying, and I'll give you the strength to do that. It all works hand in hand. So the point, Colossians is the chart and compass to sail through the many dangers facing the church today. Formal ritualism, frozen churches, and philosophy-driven churches that are theory driven. And um, and by the way, you know what pragmatism is? Someone tell me what pragmatism is. You do what everybody else thinks is what's going on. Like you, Good. Whatever okay, that's part of it. Happens. Pragmatism. Anybody else know? What is it? I'm a very pragmatic person. You do what you think is right. That, and you do what thinks is going to work. Yeah. Okay? A lot of businesses yeah. are pragmatic. They'll say, well, this is not working. We're going to do something different. So your answers are correct in that sense that a pragmatic church, what's a pragmatic church going to do? Well, they're going to emphasize the things that get people to come. Rock bands. Yeah. So I'm going to get, hey, what's stopping, okay, what's stopping a church from saying, because we know churches will do this, well, I just want to get as many people in here as possibly can. So what do people like? And by the way, there's people, I, I know that I read... Um, uh, Rick Warren's book on uh, the purpose driven life and how he started Saddleback Church in California. He said, I went door to door, knocked on doors, and I just asked people what they wanted in the church, saved or not. He goes, What kind of music do you want to listen to? And he says, And they'll say, Well, I listen to country music. He wrote that down. Well, what do you mean? I have a reggae, disco, or rock, or whatever. So in his services, he has all that kind of music. So he says, That's what they wanted to hear. So I put that in there. And of course, he says he preaches the gospel, and, and I'm not going to doubt, I'm not going to knock that, but he, he adds everything else because that's what people want to hear. So that's why, boom, everybody started coming, right? <clears throat> so that's pragmatism. Same thing is true. What's stopping from somebody putting on the, the sign out front uh, free wine with mm -hmm. lunch? Yeah. I mean, right? Real great juice. <laughs> yeah, why not? So it really, when you think of it, what's working? <coughs> Free lottery ticket for the first 10 people that walk in. Uh -huh. See? It really, there's no stop to it. You know, and people say, well, I'm preaching the gospel as well. Okay. But see, this is what churches have started to do. They started to realize, or at least in their mind, if I'm going to reach the world, I've got to be like the world and give them what they want. And God never says this. Mm -hmm. He always says, preach the gospel in its purest form mm -hmm. Uh, of of doctrine and I will be with you okay by the way the gospel is an offense okay. right mm -hmm. it's an offense the offense of the gospel mm -hmm. so how do you get people to come if you're offending them all the time well you don't offend them you don't preach the gospel or you water it down in such a way where there's no more repentance it's just hey this is what Jesus did don't you want to believe that well yeah I can do that and they add Jesus to everything else they do. No repentance. And this is huge today. When you start preaching, repent of your sin. Trust Christ as your Savior. That offends people. Unless the Holy Spirit is convicting them and they say, I needed to hear that. And I am ready. And they, and they get saved. Then they're truly born again. See? But we filled our churches full of false converts. Is what we've done. Okay, that's why this book is so good. Okay. Look at uh, the point under there where it says William Sanday. That is actually the right spelling of this guy's name. 
William Sanday, uh, he says this, in the Ephesian epistle, the church is the primary object and the thought passes upward to Christ as the head of the church. The Colossian epistle, which we're studying, Christ is the primary object, should say, and the thought passes downward to the church as the body of Christ. The dominating thought, Christ is all. He is all I need. He is everything. Charles Wesley said, Thou, O Christ, art all I want more than all in thee I find. It's all about Jesus, isn't it? And uh, at this point, I really don't care what other churches are doing. I know that as a pastor of this church here, we preach Christ. We preach the word of God. We stand firm on the word of God, and that's it. If you don't want to come, then don't come. If we don't have the music that you like, okay, I'm not going to change what we believe is our standard of music that honors and glorifies the Lord just to make you happy, you know, because it's not about you, it's about Jesus. So maybe you need to change and figure it out and then come on. Otherwise, go on another church. And so uh, that's tough. It keeps you small, (laughs) but it also keeps you pure. That's Mm -hmm. what we're we're trying to please the Lord in that sense. But um, all right, number two application so number one is introduction now let's talk about the actual application of chapter one so let's go to chapter one now and let me read a few (laughs) verses to you uh from the very beginning chapter one verse one everybody paul an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god and timotheus our brother so timotheus is another word for timothy okay um are there any books of the bible that are called timothy yeah, first and second Timothy. Are they written by Timothy? No, they are written to, to Timothy. Timothy. Okay, by Paul. Okay, Paul wrote thirteen epistles in the New Testament. Um, he wrote a lot of them to a lot of people and a lot of churches. So that he started, and he has Timothy with him right here. He says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. So there's that city, and these are faithful believers. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Keep reading. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. Look at verse 4. He says, since we have heard. He wasn't there. He didn't actually see them. That's what we say. He didn't lead them to Christ, you know. Uh, everybody raise your hand, pray after me. He didn't do that. He, he didn't know anybody. He just said, I heard about you guys. It's pretty cool. Heard about your church. Mm-hmm. Now he's writing a letter as an apostle. Verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? Now remember again, that word gospel is a power-packed word. What did Paul say in Romans 1.16? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation. So what is the gospel? Yeah. Someone says, I preach the gospel. What does that mean? You just walk up to somebody, gospel. I'm preaching the gospel. But what is the gospel? Well, what does the gospel say? What, what does it describe? It describes the word of God. Jesus. Paul tells us what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15. It is the death of who? Christ. Christ. The burial of Christ. The resurrection of Christ. Christ. Right. All of that's together. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. That's, That's the message of the gospel. And then when you give the invitation of the gospel, he says that you need to repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said it twice in Luke 13. Did you read your text? Look at that. Go back to Luke. I, I got a kick out of not a kick out of this, but I thought it was interesting. You know your Bible reading uh, calendars that you guys are in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You probably just read this recently, not today, but uh, Luke uh, thirteen. Just read this a couple days ago. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galilean Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answered and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Oh, that happened because they were sinful. No, he says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Mm -hmm. Jesus goes on, Or those eighteen upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell and slew them when you you thought they were sinners because they died in a bad accident? Verse 5, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, you'll all likewise perish. God wants us to repent. It's very clear. Okay. 
So the gospel is, I'm preaching the message. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again. The invitation is, you need to repent and believe that. You need to turn from your sin and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Are you going to do that? So that's the gospel, and that's an offense to people. Well, I don't need to repent. Can I just believe in Jesus? No. He didn't say that. He says, you need, you need to repent, otherwise you're going to likewise perish. First uh, Timothy, is it 3.9 of 2nd or First Peter, that says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that yeah. all should come to repentance. repentance. Not belief, yeah. repentance. He wants you to repent and trust him. So it's very clear, but we don't hear that much anymore. So here we go. So um, the application in chapter 1 and verse, keep reading now. So he says, I preach the gospel, verse 5, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. And bring forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. I love the word truth here because he says it all the time. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. So who is the pastor? It's Epaphras. He is the faithful minister of Christ right there in Colossae. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. He is the one that told Paul what's going on down here in Colossae. Man, great things are happening. People are getting saved. They love the Lord. Verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, of what's going on down there in Colossae, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And that's exactly what every pastor, every teacher wants, that you'll know God's will and have spiritual understanding. Then he goes to verse 10. Here it is. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's why you're here, by the way, the Bible study, right? Mm -hmm. You're here so that you might increase in the knowledge of the Lord. Mm -hmm. If you're not increasing, then you're going backwards. You need to be increasing in God's word. This is exactly what Paul's saying here. So look at your notes here. Number one, to walk worthy means to live your life after a godly manner. <coughs> so you are a Christian. Uh, Sunday morning, I preached a message on the Holy Spirit, and we've got an eight-part message coming series coming up. But that the Holy Spirit in you is literally the life of God in the soul of man. If you've trust Christ as your Savior, <coughs> Jesus Christ is... He says, I go away, but I will come to you. And then he says, if I do not go away, I will, I will not send the Holy Spirit. But if I go away, I will send him to you. I will come to you. One and the same. The Holy Spirit is equal to Jesus Christ, who is equal to God the Father. There's three. Okay. So when you've trusted Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit has come into your life, who lives in you is God. You have the very life of God in your soul. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life which I now live in the flesh, it's Christ that liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life that I am now living, I'm dead. But nevertheless, I live for Christ liveth in me. Christ lives in me. Who is that? That's God living in you. By faith. That means it's the life of God in my soul. So that means I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Mm -hmm. You got that? Mm -hmm. But most of the time we live defeated, discouraged, and down. Now, wait a minute. Do you realize? No. That's why the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Meaning, he's there, but you actively engage or activate that power by faith. By faith. I'm not afraid of anything, right? No circumstance. Can it get me down? Well, yeah, sometimes. Oh, and man, that, then immediately, I just cast my care upon him, for he careth for you. See, the scriptures are so clear. Who's in you? Okay. So we can walk worthy of the Lord. Okay. And that's all Paul's trying to say here. You need to increase in this knowledge. You need to understand who you have inside of you. That's why sinful things you do in the flesh grieve the Holy Spirit because 
you're allowing your body to do that which God would never do. Okay, So you have the power to fight all of that. So by faith, let's do it. All right, so uh, live your life after a godly manner. Uh, look at what Spurgeon says. That's the italicized words there. A man's life is always more forcible than his speech. When men take stock of him, they reckon his deed as dollars and his words as pennies. I love Spurgeon. If his life and doctrine disagree, the mass of onlookers accept his practice, but they will reject his preaching. You heard some say, don't do as I do, do as I say. The problem is, that never right. works. <laughs> you know what people do? Exactly what you do. Mm -hmm. you, you Parents, I tell them, I, you know what? Your kids are going to do exactly what you do, mm -hmm. not what you say. You don't go to church, they're not going to go to church when they get older. You hit or miss, they're not going to do it. Well, no, 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 you need to be doing this. You need to be reading your Bible. Really? Do they see you reading your Bible? And why would they do it? See, so clearly here we are to walk worthy. And then he says, unto all pleasing, number two, uh, literally a desire to please the Lord. What is your desire, your motivation? And again, our motivation is to serve the Lord with all of our heart. That's Psalm 19, verse 12 through 14. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in my sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. You know, to live your life every day, presumptuous sins, basically, is you know that you're going to sin. Well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to do this. We do it all the time. God will forgive me. And David says, Lord, keep me away from that. Let me just live my life constantly that my mind... The words are always acceptable in your sight, everything I do. That's what God would have us be like. So why not determine that you're going to walk worthy of the Lord? And I put in here, you're not worthy, you need to be saved. So if you're not saved, you need to get saved. But then once you're saved, you can walk worthy of the Lord because he's living inside of you. Then the last part of verse 10 says that you would be fruitful in every good work. And that just simply means always yielding and having the fruit of the Holy Spirit in life. Look at the third page real quick. We're almost done. Capital C, uh, that you would increase in the knowledge of the Lord. And again, increasing is the word, it's a present participle. Okay, It means to have experiential knowledge, to grasp the meaning of the gospel, then to continue to live out its implications in your life. So increasing in the knowledge of the Lord simply means I'll never attain completely where I need to be, but I will always try to learn more. I do. You know, I have a lot of knowledge in my head uh, about the Bible, and there's more that I'm still learning all the time, but really where, I'm where I try to learn even more now is experiential. I want to know the Lord in His power. Paul said that, right, that I may know Him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. What did he mean by that? He wanted to know the power of his resurrection that God gives through the life of God himself in you. In the knowledge of God, I put a question here. What are you learning, increasing in knowledge? Remember Ken Jennings? Mm -hmm. 74 Jeopardy games. He had $3,196,000. And then by the, when I did this in 2016, there's a new guy now that broke his record. I forget his name. Younger guy, and I think Ken Jennings now there thought about him being the Jeopardy host now because yeah, talked about that. Yeah, because uh, Trebek, is, had Trebek the game is dead. Where there's three of them yeah. that did that. And yeah, yeah. It's amazing how smart those guys are with trivia. <laughs> mm -hmm. But notice Romans 16 19, I would have you wise unto that which is good, simple concerning evil. Colossians 1 9 says, being filled with the knowledge of his will. Colossians 3 10, new man is renewed in knowledge. So, again, it all goes back to not just head knowledge. That's what the Gnostics wanted. Mm -hmm. More knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge. I want heart knowledge. I want to know Christ experientially, right? That's the key here. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much for the introduction time of uh, Colossians. Pray that you'd help us to be excited about the book. And we pray that you'd help us to read it, to meditate upon it ahead of time. And then, Lord, bring us back as we study these chapters in the next uh, months as we learn this book. And we'll thank you. Thank you for the food we're about to have, for the friends, the fellowship we could have today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.